Hello and welcome to another Foreman community demo. If you've any problems with the live stream, it seems to be good today. It was okay yesterday as well. Um, but if you have any problems, please let us know and I'll drop a link to the Google Meet where you're welcome to join and watch. If there's anyone who contests that pronunciation, please feel free to correct me. Um, we're still on Freenode IRC for the moment. Um, and also you can ask questions directly into the YouTube live chat as these will all be monitored. Um, but as you're probably aware by now, Foreman is leaving Freenode. Um, at the moment we have a Libera chat, uh, the equivalent rooms that we had on IRC. We, so we have um, the Foreman and the Foreman dev as we, as we always had. And um, we will also be bridging to Matrix. So once the Matrix to Libera bridges are up, we will announce our move. So you're happy, uh, you're welcome, I mean, to, to join us at any point over on Libera or wait for the Matrix integration, but we will stagger off of this um, for the next while. So just be aware that this is happening, though I think you probably are this stage. Um, okay, Doke. So before we begin, just a few short announcements. Please um, mark your calendar and save the date and join us for the Foreman birthday party on July 1st. I've seen a preview of uh, Lukash Elzap's talk and it's not to be missed. I promise you, you'll enjoy it. Uh, we'll be announcing the full lineup over the next while. So stay tuned for further updates. And on the release side, this week, Catello 4.0.1 was released. So please update to avail of all the latest uh, bug fixes and enhancements that came with that. Um, if you would like to see a full change log, please go over to the Foreman uh, community discourse and check out the release announcement there. And I think that is everything from me. So up first, we have um, Lukas, who is going to talk to us about building Foreman discovery images on uh, EL8. So in your own time, Elzap. Sure, thank you, Mal. So uh, this is going to be quick. Um, I share my uh, browser window. You should see my. Uh, we should see the Foreman discovery image GitHub repository. So there was a question on GitHub. Uh, sorry, on uh, Discourse why we don't provide from a discovery image built on uh, uh, rel 8. We do, we do build from CentOS, but when I say rel, I mean um, rel CentOS really upstream. And so there are several reasons. And the question is basically, this was not, not the first time. And the, the reason for that, uh, the reason for the question is actually that uh, rel 8 changed some uh, things because that's actually major release of rel is the only opportunity when where red hat engineers can actually do breaking changes of course we don't do that for minor releases uh, obviously and for eight you know a couple of them and in the terms of provisioning one thing that changed is for some hardware and even virtual uh, environments uh, network uh, identifiers for you know, like network cards are diff named differently. For example, for libvirt, if you're using virt IO driver, it's no more no longer named ATH0. It's now you know one, I think. And also the original author of the of the inquiry uh, had a uh, Dell hardware, which also renamed some uh, some things. Now, obviously, if you discover a host using uh, FDI built on uh, rel seven, and then provision a rel eight. Host, however, you will uh, you'll end uh, ending up with some uh, you know confusing configurations. Uh, it's a, basically a IFC FG dash something wrong. So that's not really how you should do it. One way, one way um, until we fix that or until we provide API on rel eight, you can do uh, basically uh, a, a template change. Essentially, if you if you search for effect which is discover underscore pretty much anything like boot boot if would be one then you know that the host was provisioned using discovery and then you can do some kind of a renaming in the templates itself that would be a way out and but however i would like to touch the topic of you know building discovery image on rel 8 because it is possible we, we i have now prototype basically on rel 8 sorry on l7 we use a thing called you know um, live cd creator however 
uh, one of the reasons why we don't have a RHEL 8 build yet is, you know, previously we don't we didn't have actually packages for uh, L8. Now we have them. So if smart proxy and everything, all the dependencies are there. So that's no longer the issue. The issue is now that in, on RHEL 8, uh, there's a, you know, Live CD Creator was, you know, removed and there is a new project called Lorax, which uh, essentially mm, does the same things as Live CD Creator, but it's basically a complete rewrite. It has a lot more features. Instead of building the images uh, or be building the ISO image on uh, in a build root, basically a change root, it now supports uh, change root as well as mock and uh, containers as well as VM. So we can spawn a VM and, and do this in a clean environment, which is great. Also has a, a, a different things. And so that's the reason why uh, why we don't have that yet because we need to change our infrastructure and that includes uh, also CI upstream and also downstream uh, we need to also you know do some stuff uh, before we can do that so so in short if you need uh, send us eight build of discovery there is this uh, uh, image uh, sorry there is this uh, discussion uh, I'll probably leave a link uh, down the down the um, YouTube video so you can visit and basically, for now, what you need to do is you you initiate the build with the with the first command out of, from the readme, and then it creates a kickstart, and then you do few edits here and there, and then you basically continue building um, because you know there are some changes. There's different Ruby version. It's not uh, it's not using uh, SCL and stuff like that. And then you initiate like Life Media Creator. Um, by the way, the Lorax tool is awesome. It supports. A lot more features and things like you can even um, you can even start a server and uh, build uh, build images using a utility called um, Lorax Composer. I think it's the yes, command line client. So we would like to integrate with that in some near future. We'll see what we can do, but it's not on the table right now. So let me know in the you know thread if you work this for you. And I don't want to commit this into the GitHub repository right now because. It's completely different kickstart, a lot of changes. So we'd need to, you know, like basically like rewrite it, uh, or we'd need to make a copy of one, you know, for CentOS one, for CentOS seven and eight. So, but if you if you really need that, you can work on that. I will help you with that. We'd probably need to introduce some templating, maybe, so we could have a single template for both versions or something like that. But if you know, it's not long long time before we actually we can switch over to CentOS uh, eight. So. So we'll see. Although maybe it would be a good idea to keep uh, both versions for some time. Although it's different workflow, uh, we'll see. We'll see what I can do. So just, just that's all. That's all. If you need to uh, have a discovery on L8, you can do that today. That's all I have for the for you today. Uh, over to Mel. Thanks, Elsa. For it's funny um, when we're live, something can always go a little bit wrong, and usually it's something new. And for the first time ever, there was an error from OBS for I think I'm not I don't even think for very long, but there was a little bit of a hiccup somewhat somewhere through your demo, just for like a few seconds, and um, where we lost connection. So I will I have the recording of that, so I will upload it at a later time. But if it happens again, I'll ask people to maybe hop over and join us in the Google Meet. But it seems at the moment it seems fine. But if it happens one more time, I'll I'll drop the link. And if anyone has any questions um, or has any comments on on this presentation on this demo, please um, please think about them. Drop them into the chat, and I can ask them at the next interval. At the moment, I don't see anything, so we shall push on to Yifat, I believe, who's going to talk to us about Ansible check mode options via Foreman. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, one second, I will share my screen. OK, so first of all, uh, a short explanation. Uh, what I am going to explain now is about a new option to run Ansible roles uh, in check mode, uh, which is basically a dry run, uh, which means that when Ansible is executed uh, with the check mode enabled, it will not make any changes uh, on remote systems. Uh, instead, what it will do is um, if there's a module that supports the check mode, it will report that, that changes uh, 
uh, what changes uh, they would have made rather than making the changes. And other modules um, that do not support check mode will also take no action, but uh, will just uh, uh, not report what changes uh, they might have made. So um, after this short explanation, I will show you how to do this um, in Foreman now. So um, when I'm creating a host or um, editing, I can also edit a, a, a host. Uh, there is a global parameter, uh, a new one that is called Ansible Roles Check Mode. And uh, default, it is false, which means that if I am running um, the uh, Ansible Roles on a, a host and I did not change this global parameter, uh, it will not run in Check Mode. If I change it to true and then I run uh, the Ansible Roles, it will run in Check Mode. Um, so, also uh, in the report, after I am running uh, this uh, Ansible roles, I can see that uh, this ran in check mode uh, in the alert in the beginning of the report. And also, all the tasks um, will not be, uh, none of them will be in the applied uh, status, they will be in pending. Uh, because nothing really happened, nothing really changed. Um, but it will show me what was supposed to be changed. Um, so this is it uh, for me. If there's any questions, you are welcome to ask them, of course. That's it. Thank you, Yifat. Let me just check and see if there are any questions so far. Give a minute for everybody to catch up. Um, nothing yet, but as you know, you can ask questions at, at any point about uh, for it, and I will ask them when they come in. So thank you very much, Shifa. That was great. Um, our next presentations, we have three in a row from Dominic. So I will let you introduce them, Dominic, if that's OK, because there's so many. OK, so hello. I have three things to show you. Uh, the first one is uh, is related to emails. The second one is related to the posts, searching, and the third one is uh, related to reports. Uh, so I will present my screen. Let's find the correct one. Where is it? See my screen number two. Anyway, the first one is uh, related to your your screen isn't sharing at all, Dominic. Yet is okay. that I see, but I have the problem because I cannot see my screen. Okay. <laughs> Let's make this way. Right now, I think it's better. Can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the first, uh, the first thing is about emails. And uh, we know that the emails is great for communications with each other and so on. And also the foreman use them for <coughs> inform you about something like summaries, if it's something finished and so on. But if you have some, uh, if you have uh, many instances of foreman in your network, you have the problem that you cannot distinguish which foreman instance sent, sent you some email. So. Uh, I created a, I created a footer in email that it says uh, which instance of email is that. So, uh, in general, there is a settings. It's a couple of, it's for many, many days there, I think. Uh, it's called the instance title. That means that you can you can set an instance title for your format and. It shows there on the upper side, and this instance title is also used in the, in footer in email. 
uh, when it is sent because it's this footer is uh, is applied to every email from for men and also it's uh, it's sending with UID this UID can be anything you can edit them but it is uh, it can be random generated piece of string that is used for unique identification of correct instances for men and uh, I had a I had a, a mail catcher prepared for sending the email, but right now I am happy that I can share my screen with Foreman, so I didn't want to show that right now. Anyway, you can try it with test email and it will show you a footer. What is saying this female this email is sent from name of Foreman instance and with this UID. But if its instance is not set, it is only used uh, by UID. Anyway, I will go to the second thing. It's related to the hosts. Uh, hosts have a lot of attributes and hosts have uh, also effects. And these effects can be used for searching across the hosts and so on. But we also created a model called reported data. And this reported data model is used for uh, for taking uh, facts from uh, taking different kind of facts and transfer them to the better form for better searching or uh, to make them more uh, to more human readable form. So uh, this this reported data right now are, are something like RAM. Uh, count of RAM, count of cores, or boot time, and uh, I prepare. I made the, I made a PR that is uh, that's, that is adding them as to searching. So if we are type reported dot, let's say, okay, this is this is uh, the attributes that are right now in reported data so it's a boot time course disks total that means a total size of this of all disks in on hosts the size of ram and count of sockets because the cores and sockets can be different number if you have something like an intel processor with hyper triggering or the virtual attribute that is says says when the when the hosts is virtual it is different. Uh, so I will say something like RAM is bigger than two. I, I think it's a megabytes right now. So I think it is all computers. Okay, so it says it looks two. And I can use use it for search. That's the next one. It's a two one and the third one is related to the reports. So reports are nice. Reports are great because we can show a lot of things and uh, in the in the great way and so on. But sometimes the rendering of these reports can be really really long, and it means that the user have to be have to have opened the form and window for a long time. Uh, until the download button is appeared for the report. And what happened when, for example, the computer crash or electricity will be broken for a couple of time? Uh, you need to report, you need to run the report again and wait again, probably. So I made the, I made the notification for reports when the finish rendering. When they finish the rendering, so I will prepare. I will didn't prepare any report particularly, but I can show it on the host statuses report. That I just run the submit, and it's it's easy to it's easy to run and easy to render this report. So it's really fast, and I can download it right now. But also, I have a notification about that, and if I click on these three dots, I can download the report, which is redirect me to this to this nice screen with dial download button. No, actually not. Uh, it's just render downloading this report. Also, 
if I miss the time when this report is available, I can regenerate this report and it's redirect me to the same page with the same 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 fillet fields as I uh, as I uh, generated the first time. So that's all from me and I hope it, you my that you that my improvements you will like it. And if you have any questions, drop me a comment. Thank you very much, Dominic. Let me just take a look for questions. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. So just pause for a moment. And I, not um, not for now. So, um, Dominic, thank you very much for those three. Um, much appreciated, and I'm glad that you didn't um, you found your screen sharing because I know that it's always there's always a chance that that will go missing. So, up next uh, we have Andra, who is going to talk to us about host detail page charts charts refresh. Yeah. Hello everyone, I have just a really short one. Uh, we have new charts in the host detail page uh, that are using our new React charts uh, because of dropping of the old ones. So as you can see, uh, runtime and the events uh, chart is refreshed brand new. And not great. This is a uh, work in progress, uh, but um, given this page will be gone or obsolete soon, I hope that you will not uh, throw stones at me in the meantime. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. I don't think there'll be any stones coming your way somehow. Uh, let me check for any questions. I have a qu I have a question. Like we when when we have a host with Ansible report, do we show the same graph? And have you modernized that as well? Um, that's the same same chart i think that ansible uh ansible events are there as well but i'm not sure because i'm not very fond of this 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 chart so uh i'm not sure i'm not looking at it but i believe it's the same chart and actually this happens to all the charts because i changed the implementation of the helper method so all the charts that are using that were using it will be refreshed cool thanks thank you so in the uh, thank you for your question as well lucas um so in the meantime jonathan has already got set up which is great and jonathan is going to demo creating remote execution job invocations with the feature option Thanks, Melody. Yeah, I kind of jumped the gun on my screen sharing there, but I think it worked out. So mm -hmm. um, I don't normally demo bug fixes, but I thought this one has an interesting overlap with some larger changes that are going on. So why not? Um, so this change fixes an issue where specifying the feature, which I'm highlighting here, um, using hammer job invocation create would not work. It would throw some kind of error. So that's fixed now. and the reason this feature flag is so useful is because it um, removes the need to run the hammer job template list, pull the ID off of that job template, and use that job template ID in the job invocation create and specifying that ID here. So the feature is basically give a, a friendlier way to identify those particular operations and you imagine two users are talking about the job invocation create command. They can't really compare notes directly because, you know, um, 
our job invocation IDs may be different. We don't really know which uh, operations we're talking about. So this makes it a bit easier. This is actually really useful. And uh, especially when you consider the fact that the Catello agent is going away in a few releases of Catello, maybe four or five, six releases. Um, the hammer commands to invoke Catello agent on a host is something like, let's say, hammer package install, hammer host package remove. You can kind of guess what those are without maybe even really knowing those commands. So the intention here by providing feature to the equivalent remote execution commands is to kind of maintain some of that uh, guessability around those commands and make it easy. If you're unfamiliar with the list of features for remote execution, you can find them in the user interface. Under the administer menu, there's an option for remote execution features, and it lists all of them out here. And I'm just running this command now. In the terminal above, you can see my client. I'm just tailing the yum log, and uh, we can see that it did. Um, it works as you might expect it. It installed screen on here. I'm running another command to remove screen and it works. So again, just a really easy way to avoid having to look up the job template IDs and kind of, kind of helps uh, smooth the edges around the eventual removal of Catello agent. That's all that I had, thanks. Thank you, Jonathan, that was great. Um, so I don't see any questions. So I'm assuming everything is super clear for everyone. And let me just check all places, but I think that we are good to move on to the next demo, which is going to be James. And James is going to talk to us about host and host collection errata selection with remote execution. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm James Jeffers. I'm a member of the Catello team. And uh, kind of dovetailing with Jonathan was talking about, we don't normally demo bug fixes, but uh, I think we felt like this was a UI fix uh, that was uh, worth talking about. So I have a system that I've registered two hosts and added to a host collection. And uh, uh, if you go into the errata installation uh, dialog, uh, folks might be aware that if I select a group of errata and then choose the select all option. Visually, you'll get the indication that all 22 results will be selected. And if you can look, there's actually only 20 per page. So there's two more that aren't listed, but the UI would indicate that all had been selected. Now, previously, if I uh, went ahead and selected, say, uh, via remote execution, uh, and I'm going to choose customize first because I want people to see the list of errata that are included. Previously, if I'd included this, it would only, in fact, pick up the first 20 and not all 22. So we've fixed this. And if you take a look at the list now, if you count it, you'll get actually 20, all 22. That's the first uh, fix that we made. So now that select all will span multiple pages on these dialogues. This is also true for uh, not just for host collection, but also for hosts for those uh, for those selections. And I'll go over that in a minute. But also for package installation for module streams. There's one other enhancement that we added or corrected. So very similarly, um, oh, it looks like my session almost died there. Oh. The just one second because we just now now we're back we just that that error okay. happened again okay thank you james sorry to interrupt no you. problem so uh previously you could indicate a filter and the, the display would show the filtered packages but if you selected them and then selected select all as soon as you uh started the remote execution option and I'm going to choose customize first. Customize first, so you can actually see the packages. You would actually get a different result, uh, and it wouldn't carry over the security filter. Where in this case, we actually still apply the security filter even if we've selected select all. Uh, let's see. Uh, the same 
fixes or enhancements were added for individual hosts. So if I select a, a given host, and I select all of these, and I say I want to select all 22, you'll get the right you'll get the right ones. That was pretty much it. Those those were the enhancements that we added. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about those, but this should be showing up, I think, in 401 or 401, uh, but it's definitely in nightly. So. Excellent, James. Thank you very much. Let me just Thank check. you. Let me just check for questions. Yeah, that error happened again. I'm going to have to investigate that. That's the first time I'm seeing errors emerge, just say, directly out of OBS this time. So there's always something. Perhaps I need to. Perhaps I need to upgrade. And I see that um, Evgeny has been asking questions to Jonathan, and Jonathan has already answered them before I even get a chance to check. So that is good. Um, let me see if there is anything else. But I don't think so. Thank you so much, James. And sorry for c cutting in on you like that. So No problem. Cheers. Um, up next is Partha, and Partha is going to talk to us about Catello import exports of other content types and auto create of custom types. Can you guys see my screen? It's coming up now. Yeah, looks good, Partha. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let me close this one. All right. So, so I'm going to present two things. One is, I, I don't know if you remember, import export used to be yum types only. Last month, we added support for file and Ansible types. So you can actually import and export Ansible types. That is one feature. The other feature we added is what is called an auto create. So what happens here is, what happens here is when you you can when you create a new org, you, you, when you create a new org, you can automatically import everything here. Previously, you had to create these repositories manually. That that made the experience a little bit painful. Like if you had too many repositories, you had to you had to coordinate it correctly. So, what we do now is uh, when you import from the metadata, if a repository doesn't exist, it just creates it. It then syncs the, it, just, it then copies it from the metadata and updates its contents. So to demo this, I, let me do a quick one. So here I have an organization that has Ansible and file types. You can see there are three files here, eight Ansible collections. We have also three yum repositories here. Okay. So I'm I'm going to export the library of this organization and I'll then create a new organization and import it into that. So let me demo that. So let's first export the lab. Let's first export the library content export complete library. And what is it? Organization equals what is our called export three zero seven nine one. Okay, export zero seven nine one. So this should start the export. Uh, yeah, just give it a minute. There you go. All right. So now if you look at the metadata JSON that we generated, 
can do like uh, I think yeah let me try that I hope you can see it so we have you'll notice we also have the ansible types now ansible and file and all those repositories now yeah I need to import this into new organ so I'll, I'll create a new organization now we want to import this stuff so we just exported it somewhere so I'll create a new organization yeah I'm, so that's that's the thing so previously you you would have to when you wanted to import you would have to create the organization and you also had like additional things like configuring repositories creating initial product with the same name content views with the same name which was all a little bit painful uh so let's so let's import it now uh, i'll just i'll just copy paste this so that I, lose it okay and okay let me yeah that's fine that's fine. so let me do a hammer content import library right and i give it a path and i say metadata file which is my metadata 2.json so i'll just copy that okay and then finally i'll say uh, organization of course so the org we just created here import with the name import so import and as he's running, he should be importing it. Uh, yeah. hmm. Is he running? <laughs> uh, so at uh, yeah, let's wait for the hundred. Da -da -da. Yeah. It's probably a good time to get out your. Do you have a? Is it a flute or is it clarinet you play? Oh, I play the flute. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I, I was thinking of entertaining all the James Galway, but that's a different at a different time. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> let's. So it claims to have imported stuff, okay, into this org. Let's, I, I, I usually don't trust when it says that. So let me, let's check it. So I do import, just to confirm. So you see this import org already has product prod. It has all the five repositories here. It has the same number eight danceable collections, three files, similar to what we had in import org. So this not only works with the library export and import, it also works with content view import and export. And so that's pretty much all I had for my demo. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I can try to answer it. Thanks very much, Partha. We'll have you back the next time um, for the introduction, maybe, to accompany, <laughs> accompany us with music. Let me just check our many new channels for, for any questions. And I think we're good. Thank you very much, Partha. Yeah. And we have now up next is Chris, and Chris is going to be talking about two different items. The first is the auto creation of Red Hat products and repos on content import, and the next one is a Catello agent uh, deprecation warnings in the web UI. Yep. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, 
All right. Um, so I to talk uh, to bounce off of what Partha was talking about. Um, so you can create uh, custom products now on import, but um, before that you weren't able to create custom Red Hat products. So I've got um, two different organizations. I've just got a um, in this organization. I just have. <clears throat> Now I've just got this Ansible uh, product with an Ansible repository. Um, and so I've already got that export. I can't share my terminal for some reason. Um, so I'll do it behind the scenes. Um, so I've got another organization called Food here. And um, that's fine. Um, one of the prereqs is um, to be able to create the import is you have to have your manifest imported. So we do have a check against that. So if you don't import, if you don't have your manifest imported or your manifest doesn't include a product that you can import, it'll air out uh, before trying to start it. So I just do, I have a separate manifest here uh, imported. As you saw here, um, I don't have any Red Hat products enabled or anything. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and import that behind the scenes here and we will, uh, we see it go through. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and import that guy. Uh, just one second here. That is going through, so we'll just give that a second here. I mean, while that's going through, uh, let me share the Catello agent pieces. Um, so let me switch back to this guy. Um, I didn't want to do it before, like I wanted to do it live so you guys could actually see the import. Um, so while that's going through, um, so as, as Jonathan mentioned, Catello agents going away um, and a couple of releases. Um, so if you have Catello agent enabled, um, when you go to um, the content host on any of the pa any of the screens where you can perform actions, you'll see a um, a banner that will say Catello agent has been deprecated. Um, but I wanted to show the um, what we've done for if you don't have Catello agent installed. So for the first thing is remove we remove the um, if you notice before you'd have Catello agent and it would show uh, not installed. Um, and I know sometimes that would cause the UI to the host page itself to be yellow. Um, and so we've gotten rid of that. Um, and then if you go to packages, any type of package action now, you'll see that that Catello agent is removed. Um, and we just we have the drop down. If you do have Catello agent in a, um, installed, this drop down doesn't even exist anymore because we're just doing Catello agent. Um, and we respect the behavior. There's also a setting, so remove use uh, remote execution by default. Um, so that setting is honored as well. Um, so we'll honor that. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's going to show up on all of your any of your package actions. So even on your bulk actions. You'll see the drop down doesn't have Catello agent anymore. Um, so I think the import is done. Yes, it is done. So let's go ahead and take a look at that guy. Um, so let's go to content products. And we'll switch over to food. I just give it a moment. It's a little slow because this is the dev box. The nightly they're not installing. Um, so we'll go to food. So food is there. Food has 41 packages, and if I go to my content view, we should see an import content view of the Red Hat products. And there we go. So yeah, so now, to, like I said, so now as long as you have your manifest imported, and as long as your manifest ha contains the products that you're importing, um, yes, you can import everything now without having to go through. Before with before this change, you'd actually have to go through, import the manifest, enable the Red Hat repository, um, 
you know, set that to immediate, all that stuff, that manual stuff that really is no fun. Um, and that's all I had. That's great, Chris. Thank you very much. And I'll just check for questions. I didn't see any coming in. I think we are good. So we can move on now to our final of the user-focused demos for today. Uh, but earlier, Lucy was having some difficulty with the screen sharing. So Lucy, we can let's, if you're comfortable, we can try one more time. If it doesn't work, we just welcome you back next time because there's usually something goes wrong, Lucy. So there's there's nothing unusual about this at all. Okay, let me try. It's up, Lucy. Well done, well done, and uh, welcome. So you're going to you're <laughs> going to talk to us about Hammer Content Exports, I believe. Thanks, Manali. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the Chunks SGB, a uh, new option for Hammer Content Export. Uh, it's a replacement for Chunks SMB. Uh, if you have exported contents with large amount of data. You may be familiar with the, this option, Chunk Size MB, which splits the exported archive into smaller file size in megabytes. But however, with ever increasing amount of content data, file size in megabytes has become small. If you accidentally specify a really large number for the option, the export would fail. So that's why uh, Chunk Size GB is added and Chunk Size MB has been dropped. A link to this PR is posted here if you need more information about this change. Data validation is also added to the specified chunk size value. It has to be greater than zero and less than one million. That makes the exported archive size between one gigabyte and one petabyte. The STP option is available to a complete export for both version and library commands. Available to incremental export for both version and library commands. Next, I'm going to give a quick demo for complete version export. To get the organization of the content view that's going to be exported. Then we find out the ID of the content view. Then we can call Hammer Content Export for a complete um, version along with the chunk size GB specified. The export depends on how much data you have in the content. Let's take a look at the result. I have limited content data. I got only one chunk file exported. You may have multiple chunk files exported with large amounts of content data. And that's all I have for today. Lucy, thanks so much. And again, welcome. We're very glad to have you and looking forward to your future demos as well. Um, I will just check for some questions, Lucy, but I didn't, I don't see many today. Um, no, so thank you very much, Lucy. And that concludes our um, user-focused demos. So we will now move on to the section with uh, Foreman developer-focused demos, of which we have two today. So back up again is Yifat, who is going to talk to us about jQuery UI spinners um, and replacing with yes. React component. Yeah, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, I will present my screen again. Thank you. OK, so this will be short. But um, what I wanted to uh, talk to you about 
um, is that we recently um, uh, replaced the counter uh, and memory input from jQuery to a new React component. Uh, it looks the same. You can see it here in my screen. Uh, these are the count input, input and this is the um, memory input. But the, the important stuff that you need to know regarding this is that any plugins that used uh, this code through uh, two um, methods uh, in the uh, form helper, uh, which you can see here, the byte size f and the counter f can still continue to use this method because they are now um, uh, using the React code instead of uh, the jQuery that they were using before. So it's not supposed to make any changes to any of our plugins and it's supposed to work smoothly, but just so you know, you can continue to um, work with this uh, method as well. Um, this is it. That's what I wanted to let you know. Thank you very much, Shifat. And let me see. So I think we can safely move on. Um, the one thing about these different chat rooms is I have no idea where to, um, where everyone is to drop karma for for the week but uh, our next our final demo for today is from andra and andra's going to talk to us about flood charts deprecations yes so just a quick uh, notice that uh, we finally after uh, three years and maybe even a bit more as this ticket from odd from three years and some some months ago uh, shows uh, we finally got rid of the float charts and migrated to butterfly react charts so I would just like to uh, notify everyone that uh, those charts are going away and if uh, you are using them in the plugins please stop. Uh, we are trying to keep the uh, keep the helpers, as you can see here, but uh, they will go away as they are not as flexible as uh, they should be. So they will either go away or change the behavior slightly in the future. So I would uh, recommend using the React components directly. And you can see how to do it just by looking at the implementation of the helpers. So I know that a lot of plugins are still using them. The charts should work, but they are, are rendering in default configuration. And you might wish to uh, customize your charts a bit. And that should be done through the uh, through the React component pro properties directly, and this uh, helper will go away. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andra. And that concludes today's demo. So first of all, I would like to thank everyone who has demoed today it was great um it's we had a few hiccups uh, with the connection but nothing nothing out of the ordinary i would like to thank all of you who came along and watched live with us and uh, for your feedback and i have had some questions um some pings during the demo asking um how to connect to the you know when we move off a of free node how to connect to Libra, if that's the way to to say it, um, and I will add that to the video description. I've pasted it into the the chat here as well on YouTube. Um, and if you have any if you have any questions about that, I'll have a blog up and our newsletter out soon as well. So I will add it there. Um, I'd like to thank you all um, again um, for coming along today. If you're watching the replay of this, feel free to reach out with any questions or feedback to the Foreman community discourse or drop a comment here and I will chase up your query for you. So thank you very much and see you in a few weeks. All the best. <laughs>